Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, a professionally certified wildlife biologist and natural resource professional, college professor, and owner of Land Source Consulting. The Hunt Science Podcast is dedicated to bring you the latest information on popular habitat management topics, wildlife science, hunting strategies, and the general conservation and land management practices to help preserve our natural resources. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to have you with us and hope that you enjoy today's episode. With that said, let's get started. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our primary sponsor, Landsource Consulting. Landsource Consulting is an Ohio-based wildlife and land management consulting company that I own and operate not only here in Ohio, but through the Midwest and beyond. At Landsource, we work with private landowners just like you to build and develop those property-specific management programs to help bring the goals that you have on your property to life. If you're interested in getting more information on who we are and how we can help you, please visit us over at landsourceconsulting.com. There you can check out the different service packages and capabilities that we can provide. We would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to reach out to us and schedule that free consultation either through our website or you can reach out to us and connect with us on our other social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. That's landsourceconsulting.com, building relationships for a more sustainable future. And welcome to this week's episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, welcoming those who are new to the show and, of course, thanking those returning listeners once again. On today's episode, I have Neil Hogger with us, who is a uh, whitetail property specialist from Wisconsin. He's also the host of the American Landman podcast, and Neil is someone who has been pretty active on social media. He's also been on a lot of podcasts talking about uh, you know buying and selling real estate for uh, those hunters and outdoorsmen like us looking for properties to manage, looking for our forever homes, you know, whatever it is. So when it came to figuring out the type of guests I wanted to have on, I definitely wanted to have uh, somebody on to talk about this because it's something that's of interest to me. It's something that I'm looking into doing myself and, you know, wanted to talk with somebody to kind of things of consideration, the ins and outs. And you know what? I think everyone out there who has the, the aspirations of buying your own land and managing your own land for hunting and everything like that. I think we have the same questions that most people have. So I thought it would be a good idea to have him on the show and discuss those. So, you know, without, uh, you know, getting too much into anything else, because like you always, you know, you start with one topic and, and kind of go down some rabbit holes. You know, I think we did a pretty good job sticking to the topic of real estate. But of course, you know, we talked about some other things. But you know what? Let's just get this episode started. And welcome to episode nine of the Hunt Science Podcast. Let's get started. All right. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, and today I am joined by Neil Hogger from Whitetail Properties. Neil, how you doing, my friend? Hi, Eric. Good morning. Doing good. Good. That's awesome. Thanks for coming on. Um, you know, so one of the things I wanted to get into, you know, that you and I had talked about was talking about, obviously, you know, buying and, you know, selling land. There's a lot of us that, you know, a lot of people out there that are interested in buying their own land. They dream about buying their own property as far as management, hunting and things like that. But the process, you know, the process can be confusing. The process can be intimidating. And, you know, there's only so many companies that are really out there that specialize in hunting properties. And, you know, whitetail properties is one that just always jumps out. So, you know, when I wanted to do an episode on this and I had it in my my plan, to reach out, you know, to someone. And I, I've been following you on social media for a while and uh, seeing your stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm going to reach out to him. So I, I thank you for coming on. You bet. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So, yeah. So, you know, just kind of how I start off with everybody is, you know, introduce who you are, uh, where you're from, you know, kind of how you got started into hunting. And then, you know, what was the path that led you down to, uh, you know, becoming a realtor with Whitetail Properties? Okay. I'll try to keep the story less yeah. than an hour because it can get long. But, yeah. um, well, um, as you said, I'm Neil Hogger uh, with Whitetail Properties Real Estate, and I'm a land specialist in uh, my area is called Northwest Wisconsin, but it's kind of like Western Wisconsin. Um, I grew up in the state of Wisconsin. I lived here, I've lived here most of my life, except for I served in the military and I lived out on the West Coast for a while, uh, about 10 years. And um, I started off probably just like any other guys, you know, and, and back in my day, and I'm dating myself a little bit, I was born in 1964, so I started hunting, I, you know, squirrels and rabbits, and, you know, I killed my first animal with a pellet gun, a running shot, heart shot to a rabbit in a junkyard behind my house, and um, 
I just I grew up in a family of casual hunters. I mean, to us, um, we hunted for food a little bit. We hunted for sport. Uh, small game was our. That's where we started. I used to tag along with my brother, chasing pheasants and rabbits and squirrels. You know, wherever we could. And I was kind of lucky enough to grow up on the kind of outskirts of a, a town in southern Wisconsin. So I could literally walk out of my backyard. And, and carry my little bow and with me and um so that's what i did and i i just kind of learned as i went my dad and all my uncles they're all factory workers they didn't really really have we didn't have land you know we they didn't really have a lot of even time to teach me to hunt but i would tag along pheasant hunting with my brother and my uncles and i just got a real interest in i just loved everything about it probably more the social aspect than anything because I wouldn't say we were the greatest equipped hunters like you see nowadays, you know, hand-me-down equipment all the way. But I took more of a liking to it than I think anybody in my family, especially deer hunting. So I started deer hunting when I turned 12. Um, my dad took me the first year. You didn't get to carry a gun. You just kind of sat and you got mentored more or less. And we'd just hunt public land in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. And then the second year, after you were able to handle a firearm, I usually sat with my dad and um, and actually got to shoot a deer. I got a deer on my second year, a little nub and buck, 1975. And um, after that, the third year, you're on your own. He would set you out on your uh, by yourself in the woods, and you learned on your own. I mean, it, you know, it, it was just that's how it was. And um, I, I grew as a, as my family hunted. We'd hunt it every year. I grew as a hunter. We would hunt. We'd go up like Thursday night to a little town called Maryland, Wisconsin. We'd hunt in the Clark County Forest. We rented a, a house in this farmhouse. We'd rented a room. We packed like 11 guys in there. And it was just a real social atmosphere. Um, we shot a lot of deer, you know, we just go deer hunting. We did, it wasn't about trophies, it was about whatever was legal. Every deer that came by, you were scoping them for a three inch legal spike. And if that's what you saw, that's what you took. And sometimes we'd get bigger bucks and sometimes we'd get smaller bucks. And we enjoyed every minute of it. I mean, honestly, when I look back, Eric, those are probably the best memories I have. It wasn't about horn size at all. And now, you know, every picture of every kid shooting his first buck is a Pope and Young or, you know, Booner. And I mean, you don't see guys posting spikes. And I've shot more spikes than 10 guys combined, probably. So I think a lot of people, I think that's probably a norm for a lot of people, you know. And I've talked about this in the past to where, you know, the, the social media kind of thing has, I don't know, it definitely hasn't hurt hunting, I, I wouldn't say, but, you know, I said, kind of along the lines of what you said, you don't see a lot of people posting photos about a doe that they harvested, you know, yeah. a really mature doe or something that like they're, it's like they, they're proud of that deer, but there's that hesitation to kind of post, you know, about it. And, and to me, you know, as a biologist, I look at those, I'm like, Hey man, that, that's just important as a part of a hunt for, for whitetails as that Pope and young. And I mean, that, that's still a successful harvest. You still have meat in the freezer. You still have opportunity to go back out and look for that mature buck if that's what you're chasing. You know, I mean, it's it. There's nothing to be you know uh, ashamed about, if you will, or even hesitant about. Maybe ashamed's not the right word. Hesitant about, you know, posting. A friend of mine, you know, his daughter posted, or he posted his daughter shot, you know, a, a buck the other day that that wasn't the biggest buck in the world. But I mean, that she's gonna remember that for the rest of her life. You know, type Heck, of thing. Yeah. That that, like you said, the social aspect of that, I think, is one of the main things that is so appealing to hunters because again with with my friends we were having a campfire last weekend you know a lot of us were hunt, hunter or our hunters and things like that i'm like this is what it's about man we had a bottle of whiskey we had cigars we were telling funny stories we're getting amped up for opening duck season you know coming up up here so we're talking about where we're going to go and it's like you know that that social aspect i think is a very very important uh, part of hunting, but I think there's two categories to it. I think, you know, what you experienced as a child, you know, as a kid and with your family and, and getting that social aspect, I didn't hunt growing up. You know, I came into it later in life in my early twenties and, you know, building that friendship and, you know, those friendships with people that have that same, you know, passion and, and pursuit or hobby, whatever you want to call it. That, that's, that's a bond, man. Those are some, you're going to be your lifelong friends as, as your hunting buddies, you know, for sure. Oh, so that's absolutely. a, that's a big thing. So that's awesome. So, so, uh, 
you know, what led you, so what got you started? So I know you had a, a, a diverse path, if you will, to the world of real estate. Um, but let's kind of talk about, you know, kind of how you got into real estate, you know, what made you want to make that shift to, to pursue, you know, selling properties for, for white okay. guys. Well, like a lot of things, you know, at least in my life, um, it, I didn't start off thinking I want to be a, a realtor at all. I know it wasn't even on my radar, but I started buying real estate, um, probably about 1996 or seven, um, it started to like get on my radar. I was meeting people that were buying real estate and they always were fairly wealthy. And at least in my opinion, um, I got out of graduate school and I bought my first home and, um, I lived in it for a couple of years and then the equity went up. And at the time in the mid to late nineties, um, even into two, early, early to mid 2000, the, the real estate market where I lived outside of Minneapolis, called the Minneapolis Metro Market, was just going haywire. I mean, there was just development everywhere and, and people were buying and selling. And so I bought my first little house and um, went and moved into it. Didn't really even do anything to it. And within about two and a half years, I had, I think I bought it at like 130-ish. And I, and I think I sold it at about 180-ish. And so I had $50,000 of equity minus my closing costs and realtor fees. And there was a, I lived in this little town kind of out in the edge of the metro called Albertville and it was exploding. It was like a freeway town with a, two exits. And next thing you know, there was just houses everywhere and they were converting farmland into housing tracks. And I saw, I think I had big eyes, you know, I saw these homes popping up and I was a single guy and I was actually making some good money working in the pharmaceutical industry at this point. And um, so I bought a second home and I moved up from the 130 that I initially purchased mine, sold it for like 177, took that equity, moved it into another one. I think I paid 300 for that, and, but this one was on a golf course. And so I got in there, it was kind of a spec home. It wasn't completely finished. So I carpeted and put a yard in, put sprinkler system in, kind of did all this end, end work to kind of finalize it. And within eight months, I was looking at another house. And so I made an offer on a piece of land and built a brand new home in Eden Prairie. And then I rented my home and um, did a land contract on it to sell it to the guy. So he gave me like $18,000 cash down and then we contracted that he had to buy my home within five years um, at a predetermined price. I think it was like 350000 something like that. And uh, so not only did he was he paying me, he gave me a big cash down payment and I had a land contract on it. So then I moved into the Eden Prairie home and I built that place. So I used his money to go to the next one. And what I was doing is I was kind of stepping up in the residential market and I kept getting more equity, more equity, more equity along the way. And then that led me into the hunting land as I, I harvested $100,000 of equity roughly out of one of my homes, my home that I was living in in Eden Prairie. And, um, or excuse me, in Albertville, the, the golf course home. And I bought a piece of hunting land. I didn't know what I what I was even doing, and we could talk more about that. But that's how I got into the hunting land aspect: is I harvested equity out of my home and to buy it. So I started diversifying. Um, and the reason I got into the hunting land is just I just wanted my own place. I mean, I we hunted state land forever, and and we were shooting okay deer and lot you know a lot of deer, but nothing big and. But I saw this opportunity to buy this piece of property at a really good price. I bought it at $900 an acre, and um, I just took it. I, I mean, I didn't even know what I was doing. The guy that, that I bought it from was a physician, a uh, surgeon. He actually filled out the purchase agreement with me and did the title work. I, I don't think I even went to a title office. I went to his office, and it, I, it really could have been a bad experience because I probably made every mistake in the book. But I just wanted a piece of land, and... He took pity on me and we, it happened and it worked out fine. But um, so that buying and selling was in my blood. And then I started buying some rental properties. Um, and um, that was like another diversion from the real estate. I, I had my residential, I had recreational, and then I had rental properties. So I started doing that. And I, I kind of learned as I went. And I listened to a lot of podcasts. Like I started off this guy named Carlton Sheets 
how to buy real estate with no money down. And I literally bought one of these like midnight infomercial kits of how to do this. And I started reading it and it made zero sense to me. It was just a, like, it was, it was a foreign language, the, the, the words in there. I, it, I had no context to begin. But like a lot of things, when you start to like just dive in, you learn as you go. And if your mind, you know, is there, your butt will follow. And that's what happened. I just started meeting people and talking to people. And pretty soon I noticed that people thought I was kind of expert because I was actually doing it and they wanted to do it. And they were asking me questions. And I'm like, wow. And it just kind of progressed. So by this point in my put, you know, go forward into the late, uh, like 2015 area, I was in medical devices. I was, uh, um, 22 years into that career. And I was actually a director of sales at a medical device company. And one day I was, uh, coming into work and I'm shortening up the story a little bit, but I was told uh, we just sold the company. You're out of a job. And so I made some money on stocks. Um, I called up Whitetail Properties Real Estate, Dan Perez answered the phone and I asked Dan, how do you become one of you guys? And Whitetail Properties at that time was probably, I think they started in 07, 08, and so this was like 15, so they were less than a decade old. And Dan offered me a job in a territory. And initially I said no, um, because I knew it wasn't a good territory, it's not where I needed to be or I wanted to be. But I stayed in touch with them for about eight months, and then finally my area where I'm at now in Western Wisconsin opened up. And so that's when I became, so it's kind of like a transitional career. Yeah. That's how, that's basically what it became or what it was. Yeah. But you know, it worked out. I mean, as an outdoorsman and someone who's interested in real estate, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like, Hey, that, that's, that's what it's, you know, that, that's a, that's a good fit. Um, God, I have so many questions and I'm in it. And as you're talking, I'm thinking these questions and I'm trying to think, okay, chronologically, you know, best way to keep this, you know, kind of going, but you know, so talking about, you know, now that you're a, a hunting land, you know, real estate agent, um, I don't know the best way to describe it. I guess we can leave it there. Land yeah. specialist. Real land specialist. Agent. There we go. So obviously buying and selling land. So I'm thinking of this from a perspective as a listener and even myself, you know, because when it comes to like, let's start with hunting leases. Okay. I know there's a lot of people out there that can't afford, you know, to buy their own property. But they go out and they seek, you know, a piece of property and they get into a lease with a with a landowner. Is this something that you commonly see? And is there anything to like talk about, you know, as far as that goes, you know, as yeah. far as what to look for, you know, bad experiences I'm sure you've seen. And for people listening, I'm sure there's people listening to this that are going to be thinking about doing it. Maybe they already have done it. Maybe they had a bad experience. But from the real estate agent, land specialist perspective, Let's talk about, you know, the first stage is I can't afford to buy property yet, but I'm looking at doing a lease. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll so I'm going to, I'm going to set it up like this. I run a business and I happen to sell hunting land and there's this, there's this kind of this separation between the love of hunting and the love of land and the passion that, you know, millions of guys call me up and talk to me about it. And sometimes I have to remind them that I'm actually in a business here and I love hunting and I've been so blessed to combine my passion with business and my acumen for business with my passion for hunting. And so leases come up and I actually get, I get, I get questions all the time. I'm looking for a lease. Can you help me find a lease? And I just say leasing is not my business. I'm not into leases. Um, there are people that make a business out of it. It's just not mine. Do I come across leases? Yeah, I do. I got one right now. I'm really close to getting a listing of 25 acres. That's not good hunting property, but it's right next to a 40. That would be great. And I'm trying to negotiate with the seller a, a deal where I would sell their 25, but I would provide a perpetual hunting lease on his 40. So in that sense, I'm trying to work out a deal for a lease. But most of the time when I get opportunities for leases from landowners, I just, I just back out of it. Or what I do is I'll, as a value add, and maybe just because I want to keep myself in the forefront of all my followers so that I bring value to them, um, is I will advertise this lease, but I don't ask any money for it. I don't get paid for it. I, I don't even try to get paid. I just do it as a value add. And so 
I put it out on my Facebook page, Instagram, and say, hey, here's a lease, somebody call it. And at that point, I just step back because I don't want to be, I don't want to be financially, legally, or any other way involved. And I tell people, yeah. leasing's not my business. I don't make money off it. And as much as I love hunting, and this isn't all about money, hey, that's how I keep my lights on. It's a business to me, and it's my passion. So I don't really get into involved in them. Yeah, that's fine. Like I said, it just, you know, I, I've heard horror stories of people getting in leases and stuff like that. So yeah. I, did, I didn't know. And, and I was like, well, maybe just bring it up. Um, so going into, so how do, so now kind of a, from the, from the biologist perspective here, when you look at properties, how do, is there any training or anything that you've gone through or is it just over the years to be able to look at a property and say, hey, this property is a good hunting property yeah. or it's got potential? I mean, you know, what are you just taking? And I'm, I'm asking just kind of, you know, broad questions here. I mean, it, what's the research that goes into making that decision? Well, OK, you're a biologist and I actually started off at, uh, at to be a biologist in my first round of education when I first tried college and I wasn't very good at it, but I was going to be a wildlife management uh, uh, and forestry major minor. And um, I learned that I was much more of a passionate hunter sitting in a tree stand than I was sitting in a lecture hall. So my first round of college didn't go so well and I dropped out. Um, but. There is some training that comes along with it, and a lot of it is, uh, yes, you get formal training. When you go to Whitetail Properties Real Estate and you go to our, this is, I don't want to like pound their drum too much, but I mean, the training that these guys get or that we get as a company is just, there's just nothing like it. I mean, you walk out of the door and you are ready to sell and you know what you're doing. But a lot of, and that's the business side of it combined with the stuff that you can't pick up in a classroom. So like if you follow my YouTube channel, I talk about biomes a lot and I use these management biology terms. A lot of people are like, what the heck's a biome? You know, I'm like, look, just think of a habitat type. Cornfield is a biome. Your yard is a biome, a hardwood forest, a, a swamp. But, you know, that term um, is not something you regularly use by the average agent. And, and the way that I learned that was my college education, working around all the great land specialists at Whitetail Properties Real Estate, reading on my own, and all these years of experience are just something you cannot recreate. Um, you can read it in a book, you can read magazines, and you can join QDMA, and you can watch copious amounts of video, but until you're actually out there doing it every day, yeah. it's just, you're not, it doesn't become you, right? So, yeah, I would say my life has trained me to do this. And then for me, combining that with the business side, which is, I think, is like the when you look at at what I do as a business and why I'm, I'm going to say it, I'm pretty successful at it. There's guys way more successful at this than I am, I'm telling you that. But I do pretty good. But it comes from this ability to cross over. Because if you're all about hunting and, and, and all about passion hunting, and I, I get guys all the time that come to me and say, hey, I want to do this job that you do. You have the dream job. I love hunting. I mean, I'm in the tree stand from September to the end of January. And I say, well, you'll never make it in this business if you're that. Because you have to be working you have to be passionate about it. And a lot of our guys, we travel all over the world and, and we hunt and we do get it, but it's not all about that. And so your training comes from doing it, but also doing the business side of it so that you can put it together into one offering and then keep your client on the straight and narrow legally and contractually and help them through the entire process. So it's not book learning. It's some book learning, but it's life experience all combined with that passion. That's, I don't even know if I'm explaining that right, but that's no, the it, big difference. It makes perfect sense because, I mean, you use the analogy all the time. I mean, wildlife management, you know, someone who does it, I mean, it, it's an art form. It's, it's, it's an art form that uses science. You know, it's like medicine, right? I started off in veterinary medicine and it's like, you know, medicine is not a science. Medicine is an art form that uses science, you know, to you know, practice medicine, right? So it's when you're talking about an artist, you can study all the art history, art theory, but if you don't put paint to canvas, you know, it's, you, you're, you might not be that good at it, you know, type of thing. And, and you yeah. get more experience. It's the same thing. You know, I tell my students at the university, I'm like, listen, you know, we can, you know, I, this semester I'm teaching a forestry class. So, you know, we're talking about, 
you know, all the all the stuff forestry related. And it's like, well, you know, until you get out there and actually mark timber and ID timber, you know, take DBH measurements and, and, and you're actually out there. And then you get to the point to where you're doing select cut harvest. So you're doing a crop release, you're doing a clear cut, you're doing prescribed fire inside, you know, a timber stamp. Like until you actually get that experience, like it, it can that that's where the learning really comes in. It comes in in the experience. It, you know, I would, I would totally agree with you. So if you look at like realtors and, and a guy that's out there wanting to find a piece of property and you can go on Zillow and, and, or whatever, Trulia and find these properties and probably the vast majority of them are represented by a residential real estate agent and they can, and sometimes they do a great job, but then every now and then you run into a land specialist. So like, like a Whitetail Properties land specialist, shameless plug, all right? So I was literally just hey, do loading it, do up. Do it away, man. That's why we're Okay, here. all right. So, <laughs> and then there's a lot of great companies, but that's yeah. fine. So anyways, um, so just this morning, I was loading up a listing, and I spent um, a good three hours out on that property, and I tracked my, my walk through an app that I have called MapRite, and I tracked my trail, and along the way, I was taking photographs of things as I went, and I'm doing a couple things. You know, there's this experience soup that we talk about, this stew that of experiences that all add up to this, you do a great job. You know, the average realtor could do the same thing. You just walk through the woods, you take photos, and you put them up on the MLS, and then you advertise hunting property woods deer and you put a price on it and somebody will buy it simple as that but what i do goes way beyond that i do the same thing i do those basic steps but i went out there and i paid attention to the lay of the land i i photographed the edge of the tag alder swamp with the hardwood ridge. I found these little kettle moraines, these little depressions that were scrubbed out of the land. And I found the pinch points and the travel routes. And then I started thinking and, and recording, okay, there's gonna be some sign here. And sure enough, I found the rubs. And I took note of the tree stand trees that are around it. And I took note of the direction of the prevailing winds that I can generally expect. And I started like, you know, this experience started coming out of me so that when I, listed this and I was uploading my photographs, even, I mean, I do this all the time, but even I said to myself, man, I did a hell of a job this time. I mean, I really did this. I, I sit out there, I sat down on this ridge with my dog, Lucy, the land lab, and we sat there and I could smell the woods and I listened to the the whispers of the wind and, and I heard the ducks popping off the the pothole, the wood ducks, you know, the peep, 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 peep that they do, right? And the, I, I took photographs of the corn and I, I just took pictures of things that the average realtor that doesn't have this passion. And yeah. when I start, to, you started shaking your head when I started talking about these, the sounds and the smells, because guys like you and I understand that, right? And so when you put this all, I'm, I'm getting my hairs kind of stand up when I say this because this is how I feel about it. And when I talk to people and I start telling them about a property, that passion and that, I mean, I've literally had their soil in my fingers and I've smelled it and I, you know, and, and I started noticing the differences of properties and that translates to ability to sell the property because the guys that I sell go, God, you're really into this, man. I've never met an agent like you that's... I go, I literally have sat on the ground and just absorbed these properties. And that translates into selling. And I think that's the big difference between a residential agent that maybe doesn't do land like we do, that yeah. just photographs deer, woods, swamp, which yeah. is negative. A couple and I'm tracks. like, no, but you know, <laughs> yeah. all that stuff comes out as that passion. So that's the big difference of what we do. Yeah, and I'll tell you too, I mean, a couple of thoughts there is, I mean, you're looking at it not only from a realtor standpoint, but as the end user, right? Because you are that type of person. It's like, okay, well, if I was buying this property, like, you know, you're looking at this from, from a land management specialist, you're looking at it from a hunter, you're looking at it from, the, if someone buys this property, what are they going to want to do with it? They're going to want to hunt the property, right? They're going to want to know where these pinch points are, where these stands are, where the rub and, and, and things like that. But I'll, I'll tell you, it's a good point because I remember years ago, the wife and I, um, we were look, we were moving and we were thinking about buying property to build a house on. 
and just couldn't really find property that I liked, you know, that you know, she liked, she wasn't really, you know, too picky about it, but, you know, we couldn't find anything. Like I remember, you know, uh, a realtor calling us and was like, Hey, I found this property is like 30 acres or something like that. And, uh, you know, residential, uh, uh, realtor. And I was like, yeah, that sounds, you know, great. Let's go look at it. And me being the biologist, but I also do, a a lot of environmental permitting and stuff like that for Army Corps of Engineers, EPA, that kind of stuff. I show up there. It's like a category two, you know, forested wetland, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, what do you want me to do with this property? Like, we want to build a house. Like, you understand, like, the permitting that would go into like this? Yeah. You're not building anything on this. You know, it's just not knowing what you have and listing it as something. It's like, like, no, you know, someone's going to buy this and then go to build and then realize the permitting that would have to go into that it's just that's a nightmare you know it's yeah. like it's, i mean we took i'm not kidding you we parked on the side of the road i took like one look at this and i'm like no no thank you like it's it just we can I mean, we were, my wife barely got around the car you know and i was like we're not looking at this like right. i pulled an aerial up on my phone i'm like this is all this is all this is all wetland like this isn't happening you know, type of thing, you know, but that it's like you say, like in tune, it's understand where you go. I mean, I think that's, it's like that with anything, you know, if you want to buy hunting land, whether it's with whitetail properties or the other companies that are out there, it's like, go to someone who knows what they're, they're, they're a realtor, but they also, like you said, they have a passion for this. They're, they're end users, just like you, they're hunters. They, they, they're looking at these things for you. I mean, I've seen the descriptions and I've seen the, the, the content you guys put out. And, and it, that's why I was asking because I'm like, you know, a lot of you guys, every time I see, you know, a content with you guys and, and listen to you guys talk, I'm like, hey, I'm like, you know, you know, that, that, yeah, that, that's awesome. You know, that, that sounds good. That's how I would look at it, you know, type of thing. So I was always just curious, yeah. you know, because you, I will see guys' profiles on there and some guys have degrees in wildlife science, Yeah, you know, and, and some guys don't, you know, so it's like I, I figured and you look at Perez and those guys that have been around for a while and they've got friends at over, you know, like the NDA and they're involved in all this stuff. And it's like, hey. Like, you know, they're involved in this, exactly the way to describe it. So just curious well, you know, as far as that goes. But, yeah. Well, every, you know, I, I'm not going to say every one of us owns land, but I would say it's definitely we all aspire to own property. And some of us own thousands of acres and some of us own 20. But, um, you know, so like you go back to that realtor that like showed you that category one or whatever, how you described it. I get this a lot. So I get these, you know, our listings go out on every website. And, and if you, if you're a buyer, maybe you don't even know this, but you hit contact agent, that's most likely not coming to me. That's going to go to some residential agent that's bought the rights to that zip code and every contact comes to her. So the first call that you get is, hi, yeah, how can I help you? Oh yeah, I'd love to show you that property. Well, can you tell me about the property? Um, Yeah, well, well let's uh, well, let's get a little showing. What's your name? What's your number? What's your phone number and, and contact information? Now they kind of got you in their system. And what they're trying to do is capture you as a buyer lead so that they can say, I represent this guy. He's my guy. And then they'll say, well, let me, I don't have the file right in front of me. Let me, uh, now that I have your information, let me call you back. And so they'll call me and they'll say, hi, I have a client, which they're not a client. They're just some random person. A client means you actually have a contractual relationship with them. They're a customer, if even that. Uh, can you send me everything you have about this property? And to me, that's the first tip off that they got a Zillow lead. They just got this random phone call. And so... Not that I don't want to sell it to him, but I'll ask him, well, tell me about your buyer. Like, what's he looking for? How does he want to hunt it? Is he pre-qualified? How much is his budget? What's his timeline to buy? How does he want to hunt it? How does he, does he want to build on it? Um, you know, all these qualifying questions that you really need to know about every buyer because A, you're about to take somebody to maybe my farm and I use my farm. I don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry walking across my property. For all I know, they're scoping it out to rip me off, right? Um, there are like professional shoppers that have no intention of buying, but they like to walk on these properties. They want to look for sheds. They just want to snoop because they're a neighbor. And this is their opportunity to get on this property in a legal way. Um, so I'll ask a lot of questions before I'll like give out information for my clients. Sometimes I share it right on 
the MLS, the disclosures are right there. And these agents haven't even taken the time to go to the MLS and download what's already there. And I'll ask them that. Have you been to the MLS? All these things are already there. And the answer is no. A lot of them, no. Some yes, but a lot of them, no. They just want to kind of like get the process started for that guy. And what that translates to for you as the consumer, the buyer, is a very low quality experience. Because you're looking at properties that don't fit your needs and don't fit your desires and, and it's, it's a waste of your time. On the other hand, I've got buyers, like yesterday I had this guy call me and he said, I found you on your YouTube channel. Um, so he watches the American Land Man show and he sees me talking and he's like, you seem like a guy that really knows his stuff and, and I could tell you're seasoned as a salesperson because I've been in sales for a long time, that your mannerisms and, and I'm like, okay, well, how can I help you? And he starts saying, I'd like to look at this property. And I said, okay. Uh, and I started asking some questions, these qualifying questions. He kept cutting me off. And finally, I, I, I just said to him, I'm going to call him Mark. I said, Mark, I said, I'm trying to understand what you're looking for so that I can give you a really quality experience because this may not even be the property that, we, that you're interested in. And I could tell he'd been talking to other agents and all my questioning was actually kind of getting him a little miffed at me. Like you're asking a lot of questions and to me as a, as a guy, like I, I, again, I'm going, I'm running a business. Okay. If you're not a guy that has the money to buy or the time to buy, or I don't have land to sell you that uh, that's what you're looking for, then there's no use for us talking at this level yet because I don't have anything for you. And it, it was an odd, it was an odd, you know, way of having this conversation. And then uh, I called him back a half hour later after I got him to send me his information so I could put him in my system. I could simply set him up on a matrix search and I'll start barraging him with every listing that comes up. But I told Mark, I said, Mark, this is a very low quality way of finding you a property. I want to find you the right property. I don't want to just shotgun stuff at you. And then he started letting his guard down. He goes, well, yeah, that's what this other agent did. They started sending me stuff that didn't didn't uh, match what I was even looking for. I'm like, well, I tried to ask you some questions, but you cut me off and I, that's what I'm trying to do. So I had to overcome this like preconceived idea of what agents are and how they have dealt with him to get him to like buy into me a little bit. And, and like it went from, I'm, you're just another agent and I'm trying to get every agent I can looking for stuff for me to, the right and I told agent. him, when you do that, you got nobody looking for anything because you're trying to play everybody. And I got him down to, I got your name, I got your number, I've talked to you three times today, and I've slowly gotten to know you a little bit more, and now I got you in my head, and I, I got this Baron 100, and let me, let me send you this, I'm gonna send you a link. This is fresh, it's not even on the MLS yet. And so I took it to a different level than, let me get you in my car, let me drive you out to a property, and you go, and this is, in two seconds, you know that this is not for you because I didn't qualify, that agent didn't qualify you. So um, it's a much higher level of experience, it's more, more like a boutique level experience. I'm not trying to be everything to everybody. I'm trying to sell 50 properties a year. That's it. More if I can, but. Yeah, I mean, that that's what it is. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're looking to buy, you know, hunting property, I mean, it's it's valid points. I mean, you need to know what what type. What are you looking for as a person? Like, you know, a guy like me, I'm not just going to be looking for whitetail. Like, I want I want ducks. I want you know small game. I want you know I got bird dogs. I like to chase birds. Like, you know, all the above. So I mean, you you need to find out. And, and I think people, you know, probably I, I mean I I didn't realize there was professional shoppers. You know, quote unquote. When oh, you yeah. said that, that was kind of crazy. Like just getting on property. That's nuts. Yeah. All right. So what I want to do is uh, when we talked off air, you had your your uh, kind of category things that you were talking about as far as a successful property. Um, I guess we'll, we'll begin this and I'll outline the scenario that I gave you with a friend of mine. You know, we can kind of use that as a case study. Because I think if I remember correctly, when we were talking about that, you're like, oh, yeah, there was a couple points that we could piggyback off that. Yeah, the Fab um, Five you're talking about. The Fab Five. That's what it was. Yeah. Yep. I knew there was five, but I couldn't think of what the hell yep. we called it uh, or you called it. So um, 
so when we go in this, so I'll lay out the air, the, the situation. So I've got a friend of mine that, that is, uh, you know, he's, he does well for himself and, you know, has, he has a bunch of rental properties. The guy is very, very good with his money. Um, and was looking for an investment. He wanted that there's property that came up close to where we live. And I want to say it was like 130 acres or something like that. Um, and there was an existing house and a barn on it. He wasn't necessarily interested in the house, but he, uh, his mom was moving back from Florida. He was going to buy the property, let her live in that house. And then he was going to build a house on, you know, the back 40 or whatever it was. So he gets a hold of me and he said, Hey, you know, I, I want to look at this property for multiple reasons. I said, I'd like you to come out and look at it. Hey, I want you to look at the timber to see, you know, if it's worth, you know, anything, you know, um, look at it from a hunting standpoint, if it's, you know, a good hunting property and things like that. So I said, yeah, absolutely. He's a really good friend of mine. So we went down there, looked at this and, and, uh, you know, we're talking and, and it, it, I think the property was at, they were asking like 300,000 or something like that. And I said, okay. I was like, well, you know, we, we toured the house that was on the property. And I told him, I said, Hey, I was like, you know, with this house, I'm like, you're going to want to do invest money into fixing this up a little bit for your mom, the barn's trash. You're going to probably do something with that to hold your Bobcat and stuff like that. You know, I said, and you're going to want to build a house on the back, you know, 40, which is going to be like another $200,000. We'll say, I said, so right out the gate, you're in a, a high traffic area in a, in a township, rural township, but the closest kind of quote unquote development where stores and stuff are is about a half hour away, you know, and it's not even the greatest. Um, but I said, you're gonna have a half a million dollars wrapped up in this property. I said, if you ever decide to leave, you know, or sell the property, I'm like, you're never going to get this money out of that. Hey, no one in this area is going to buy, th they're not going to have the funds to buy this. And if they do, there's other properties they can buy that's closer, that's more beneficial if they're coming from out of town, you know, for a weekend getaway with the family, if that's why they're buying it, you know, or whatever. So, you know, that's kind of the framework for that. And I'll let you kind of okay. you know, go into the Fab Five from there. Well, first off, let's define what an investment is. Because, so I have, I have, I've had guys on my own podcast and I'm, I've got a guess that's coming. And uh, we haven't recorded yet, but we've had multiple discussions. And he's an investor in residential and multifamily. Um, his type of investment is different than the land investment. Um, it has its own nuances, its own headaches, its own benefits. They're different. When you buy a piece of land, typically, and let's talk about this, what your buddy's looking at. It's kind of a mixed-use piece of property. I see a lot. Uh, they, they've got an old farmhouse, an old building on it, and it's kind of run down. It had, maybe hasn't been improved upon. And you buy it, it's a liability because you're not making money off of it. You're spending taxes, and you're spending your own money to make it better. And you don't make money off it until you sell it. And if you do it right, you can make a lot of money on the back end, maybe five years down the road, maybe a couple years down the road. You never know. But the idea is if you buy it right and you improve it and you sell it, well, then it becomes an investment because you made money on it. But until you sell it, it's a liability. So people have to realize that all the time. And they say, I want to I invest in hunting land. I would rarely tell you you're going to find a property that cash flows. So it's not an investment. It's a liability. It can be a great investment when you improve it. Versus I have multifamily and residential properties. They pay me and I use that money to buy land and I paid off. My renters paid off my properties so they're cash. I know nothing on them and I have a ton of equity and now I can harvest that equity and move it into a recreational piece. And if I buy it right, I can fix it up and maybe sell it. And there's short term turnovers um, or maybe I buy and hold and I buy it right. I let the market increase over time, I improve it over time, and then when I go to sell a property that I've improved, it's a total turnkey property, like my farm, I bought it for about 400,000, for what I've done to it, it's worth about 600. So if I sold it, I'd make $200,000 equity or more. Um, but right now it's a liability. So I, I developed to, to try to guide people down a path of some level of organization I developed and I'm not even going to say I, I developed it. I kind of pulled things together from things that I had heard other people talk about it, like how to buy mostly residential real estate. 
and I called it the Fab Five. And so I identified five guiding principles that help me at least have some semblance of organization when I'm trying to determine if a property is worth buying or investing in. So the first one is, and this I think works anywhere in the United States that you live, and that is ge uh, geographic travel corridors. So look at any town USA and look at the freeway systems. They come in and go out of the city and they're like a spider web. And then inside the city there's connecting highways, but there's this spider web. And every place that you exit the city for the most part are gonna be the areas that people are traveling and they're leaving town, which then the further you get out, the, the development falls off. But the more expensive land is closer to the city core along those corridors. You're gonna find the shopping malls, you're gonna find the convenience stores, the gas stations, and then right off of that, three to five blocks or maybe even three to five miles, there's gonna be housing, because people don't wanna live right on that freeway, but they wanna to go to the amenities, the grocery stores. Because those things, those amenities are located where people can, they can deliver goods to it, and then the consumers buy, right? So geographic travel corridors around any town USA, if you could buy along those corridors, you're, that's always a good investment. And the second thing is demographic growth corridors. So along those corridors, as you get further and further out or closer and closer in, depending on how you want to look at it, you're going to start to see the development. So look at the first exit. Look at the second exit. Look at the third exit. You're you know, 5 miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 30 miles. Those exits will start to develop. The gas stations will show up for the truckers. And then a little strip mall will pop up. And then there will be a couple houses a couple minutes away. And as you get closer to the city, the density of that uh, demographic growth happens. And the further you get away, it lessens. But over time, it grows that way. It's growing along those corridors. So again, if you're an investor and you buy along one of those geographic travel and demographic growth corridors, those properties are always going to be more, more valuable. And it's an investment. You're, late, you're letting the, the market catch up with you. So you want to jump out ahead, which is number three. You want to be within, I would say, one hour or less is the best but probably not more than two hours away. So that one to two hours corridor is where most people want to live in that concentric circle around any town USA. The further it out, the cheaper it becomes. The further out you buy, the longer it's going to take for you to realize that equity because the growth has to happen. But people want to be away from the city, but not too far away from the city. So in my area, Anything that's 30 minutes, maybe 45 from the Twin Cities, that's the most valuable land. It's selling for, gosh, I don't know, like the average 13 to 15 acre little hobby farm will be 15 to $17,000 an acre when it's 30 minutes from the Minneapolis Metro. You jump out to 45 minutes from the Metro, now it's down to about eight or 9,000 an acre. And you get to an hour, it's probably three grand an acre. So you can see that ring, as the ring goes out, the, the, cheap, the land gets cheaper. So if you're buying property, that's how you want to look. Like, do I have, I'd like to buy 20 acre hobby farm. Great. How much money you got? Oh, I got 200,000. Great. Where would you like to be? Oh, I want to be in Hudson, Wisconsin. I said, you're, there's just no way. You don't have enough money to do that. You need to go an hour out, and we need to be looking in Polk or Dunn counties. Um, you need to be away. Oh, I don't want to travel that far. Well, then you don't have the money to buy what you want. So I have those discussions. So the next thing is when you're one to two hours out and you find your place along a demographic growth corridor and a geographic travel corridor, you want to be one to three miles or one, yeah, excuse me, three to five miles off of that travel corridor. So you don't want to be right on the freeway or right on a county road because it's busy. You'd like to get there on that county road, make a left and go down, you know, 25th Street and then make a left on Johnson's Trail and then up a gravel road to your place. So you're close to everything, but you don't have to listen to everything. You kind of feel like you're miles away from everybody. So that's number four three to five miles off of a travel corridor. 
And I think it's number four. If I lost my count, let me know. Number five is diversity. And this is where biologists love. I always tell people, look for threes. I want to see three types of habitat. I don't want an all cornfield. That does not have the same value when you're looking at recreational land. It might be great tillable ground, and that's a completely different story. I don't want necessarily all timber. Personally, I would like to see a little ag field, a little timber, and a little wetland all together. And maybe I would fold in a creek or a, or a, a, a swamp or um, diversity things like terrain. Those are things that yeah. all kind of fall into this thing. But when you find a property that has all these things, it makes it more interesting. And when I buy it or I sell it and I take somebody there, they get more excited than just a monoculture boring. So sure. those diverse properties bring value. So the Fab Five, geographic travel corridors, demographic growth corridors. Um, I like to be one to two hours from a, a central city. I like to be um, three to five miles off of the route that I took to get there, off of the county highway, whatever. And I want diversity and I want at least three types of habitat. That's the Fab Five. If I can guide myself to a property and I could check most of those boxes, then I got something. If I only check one, it's like less lower on my radar. If I could check five, that's money, baby. And I say that on my video, this is, this is money. And what I mean by that is this is gonna be an interesting property to a lot of people because it's rare. That's the Fab Five. I got you. Now, what if you have, what if you got a property that's high in diversity? I mean, I'm sure you run into this to where, you know, there's give and takes a little bit, you know, as far as on there is you have a property that's just really diverse. It's got a lot of good habitat. It's got early successional, you know, prairie grassland type settings. It's got timber, you know, row crop agriculture, wetlands, streams. You know, and you look at this property, oh, excuse me, and, uh, you know, you go on there and look at this property and you're like, man, there's, there is massive, you know, potential on this. And, Stan, you know, you get where I'm going with this, yeah. but then it's not quite in the greatest, you know, location. I mean, how much does that affect, you know, kind of your view on that as far as what you're getting per acre and, you know, what people should be looking at as far as this, you know, goes? Yeah. Okay. Well, just so I can speak to something I know. So number one is location, location, location. So if I find that super diverse property and I'm 10 minutes out of the city center, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, it's going to be way more expensive, number one, if the agent that's selling it knows what they are doing or the owner knows what he's got, because you just can't find that kind of diversity and that type of property. But so it might be a great investment because you're really close to a lot of people that would like to utilize that. But that brings a host of problems that, you know, maybe there's noise and there's traffic and maybe you're a guy that, you know, I don't plan on selling this for 30 years. So I don't want to be having a housing complex develop around me because that's going to like, that's going to imp impose on my, my bundle of sticks, which is a term in real estate. But one of them is the right to quiet enjoyment. I may not like that. So if I'm a buyer that doesn't want that type of experience, that's probably not property that I'm going to want. But if I'm an investor... And maybe I'm willing to put up with some noise because I know in 10 years from now, because I've seen maybe the comprehensive plan for that community, I know that they're going to want to build there eventually. So it might be a great down the road you know, investment and I might be interested in that. So that's where knowing what your goals are as your land specialist agent and matching them up, my recommendation is going to be different. Now, as far as value goes, if I took this, if there was such a thing, if you could take a 40 acre that had the exact same diversity, a little timber, a little swamp, a little grassland, some prairie, and I put that in St. Croix County where I live, that's going to be $6,000 an acre land. If I took that exact same piece of property and stuck it out in, let's say, Rusk County near Ladysmith, completely different. It's $1,200 an acre land out there. And it's the exact same piece of property. But it, it's because it goes back to the Fab Five. Ladysmith is a three-hour drive from the Twin Cities. Yeah, you can get there, and people do drive it. But it's outside that one to two-hour, uh, you know, circle, so it drops down. It's less desirable. So that's where that Fab Five. If you start to apply that of how people are going to think, 
that's how you can start to determine. And then there's always local market information and that matters. Yeah, I see that a lot. I see, I do a lot of projects with oil and gas, electrical utilities, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm out in a lot of these very rural, you know, townships and things like here in Ohio, you know, in other states as well. But, you know, I'll see properties go up for sale and I'm like, that's a nice piece of property, you know, and I'll, I'll have some downtime and I'll, I'll look at, look at the property. I'm like, damn, I'm like, that's a lot of money for this. And like, and, and in my head, not knowing anything really about real estate, I'm like, I mean, the closest Walmart is 45 minutes, like an hour away. Like there's nothing like I just came off the major highway and that was an hour ago. You know, then you get off there and it's another, you know, God knows what to, you know, wherever. But I'm like, there is nothing here. There's no I mean, you can't get Internet out here. I mean, you can. Good luck. You know, there's barely any cell signal. And, it, and you know, but there's mineral rights. So all of a sudden, you know, the price goes, you know, crazy high. I mean, yeah, it, it, it makes sense because from the location, obviously location and you know, geography is, is, is huge. But I still, I see some of these things and, and a lot of people just think what they have is gold, you know, a lot of times. And, and they'll be in these areas and I'm like, yeah, it's a nice property, but, you know, I mean, man, I, I would never pay that for this property. You know, like it just, you know, for me as a hunter, you know, coming down here, I'm like, there, there's some massive planning on getting down here and spending the week and, and things like that. I mean, it's just a Royal pain in the butt, you know, and it's, yeah. But, um, my question is with that is mineral, do you, do you deal with mineral rights and stuff like that a lot? It, mineral Where rights. Where you are? Well, there are mineral rights and like on a property that I owned in Northern Wisconsin and near Mellon, Wisconsin, Ashland County, there was iron ore in that area. And those mineral rights were bought up, back in the 30s probably and then they come up for renewal and you can get them but we don't really sell our land so much on the mineral rights like in ohio i was just down in ohio i had a client buy a property in southern ohio down by south of i think south of athens um oh, right on the ohio, yeah. tip of uh in near pomeroy i think yeah. it was the town yeah um so i, I was got there projects there. down there so i know that area yeah okay yeah. well maybe you can help my buddy joe because he just bought a farm down there um <laughs> so you guys talk about mineral rights in the form of gas and oil mainly gas. natural gas and oil, yeah, right? Guess, and, yeah. and maybe there's coal in that area. We don't, we don't deal with that. But let's go back to what you were getting at. Like, man, I would never pay that price. And I hear this a lot. So I start talking, I kind of chuckle inside when I hear this because I'm like, okay, well, where do you uh -oh. live is the thought I have in my head of the guy that just said that. And he's trying to buy land around him and he can't seem to buy it because people are coming from somewhere else, usually a, an hour or two away in a larger metro. Again, my major market influencers, Minneapolis, St. Paul, maybe Chicago, but to a lesser extent. And so guys are coming into these rural areas where this guy lives and they're buying the land at higher prices because they, it's like in the mind's eye of them, this has got a lot of value and they can't buy that land where they're at. And it's a, this seems cheap to them and they will buy it and they tend to, they, they'll tend to buy it at a higher than average market value. Whereas the locals, they kind of know what that property sold for originally. Like they know that the guy that bought it 30 years ago got it at $200 an acre. And there's no way they're paying $3,500 an acre for the land. It's not worth it. I say it's damn well is worth it. It's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. So here's a good example. So I just had... And maybe this guy is going to listen to this and he'll chuckle about this. So he, he wanted to buy a piece of property and he looked all over the place and he couldn't find anything. And I took him to a property and or he sent it to me and I looked at it and I said, yeah, it's 3500 bucks an acre. But the agent had it listed at five grand an acre. And so I called the agent. I said, how do you get five grand an acre out of this? Because I'm looking at every sale. I have the data. I have multiple databases. I'm looking at every sale. And if I go through there and I do some work and I filter out the highs and the lows and I look at the middle, this is thirty-five, thirty-six hundred dollars an acre all day long. And you got it at five grand an acre. How do you how do you justify that? And he couldn't answer it. And the answer was, well, that's what my seller wants. Okay. And sometimes you get that, and that's what it goes on yeah. the market. So, so it sits on the market, and so then my guy comes along and he's looking at it. And I if you want to see this pro this property, go to my 
American Landman video vlog on YouTube and find the Barron County 100 Deep Dive. So I walked in there with my GoPro and my film equipment. I flew my drone over it and I gave a really great analysis. And my summary was, at best, this is worth you know, 42.50, maybe 45, maybe 46. It isn't worth five grand an acre based on the sales and the Fab Five analysis and what my market knowledge is. It's a nice property, but it's not worth this. He ended up buying that property, I think, for five grand an acre. And I made the offer and I said to him, I'm going to tell you right now, you're overpaying. You're buying your own equity. And he says, Neil, I really like it and I'm willing to pay it because I haven't found anything that's as beautiful as this. I'm not going to deny that. It's got 25 acres of corn. It's got some wetlands. It's got good deer. Okay. And we bought it at five grand an acre. And it gets registered at five grand. And then you know, people look at that data and you just never know. But there's always a story behind why somebody was willing to pay for that. But that doesn't set the market. One comp, one sale doesn't set the market. The market is more a uh, hodgepodge of all the sales. And then like this picture starts to develop as you narrow it down to 10 sales, five sales. That's the market. And that's the yeah. land. Yeah, well, for sure. It, it, and, you know, I know I know what I don't know. <laughs> and, this is, yeah. and this is one of it. Me, me and my buddies have been talking about here. You know, they, they've got younger kids. And, and my kids are still, my kids are teenagers. And, uh, you know, one of them's 11, I guess. So not quite a teenager yet, but close enough. Um, you know, we've been talking about going together and buying some land. You know, I got some really you know good buddies of mine, but you know, you and I talked about it before too. Is you know, I kind of get a little hesitant because, a, obviously from a financial standpoint, you know, if I can go in with four buddies, you know, and, and all my friends that hunt and stuff like that, then obviously from a financial standpoint, it it, it it could make sense. But my reservation always is. You know, what happens in, in 10 years, you know, when you guys have a fight, you know, stuff like that. And, and me as, you know, they're going to look at me to manage the property like and I'm going to want to manage the property. Every deer that gets harvested on that property, I'm going to put a weight tape on it. I'm going to pull a jawbone. I'm going to do this to start having analytics and keep records like I do on my property to see weight fluctuations, to see if there's anything from a habitat standpoint that I need to do. Nerdy biology ring. Yeah. You know, but so for me, it's like, well, you know, my hesitation is, do I want to do it? Do I want to just buy on my own? You know, I want to put, you know, some cattle on, you know, a couple acres and, you know, race. It's, it's just, you know, it's one of those things. I know other people deal with it, you know, um, and I know you and I had talked about the whole going in with friends and stuff like that. So let's kind of lean into that a little bit um, as far as going into, you know, your recommendation and things to kind of think about going into buying property with other other people yeah i don't know if it's okay that i keep doing this but i keep referring back to my podcast and my social hey, media so hey man you plug it away it's going to be All in the right. description so that's well, fine I'm, not, I'm easy yeah, going i don't, I don't to, care i don't mean to like you know i do not care do at all so okay i'm not meaning to do it that <laughs> yeah. way but i yeah just for reference i actually had a conversation with one of the owners of Whitetail Properties about this exact topic. And he, he so go back to my my vlog, the American Landman podcast on Spotify and, and those sites, you know. But look for the, I think it was number one, Rob Saunders. And he actually addressed that. So what, what Rob, you know, we talked about having these partnerships. And one of the things I took away from Rob was, number one, know who you're partnering with. And anytime you start to do these partnerships, Eric, I would like really, really just slow it down and like talk and get to know that person make sure you guys goals line up then secondly before you ever get into a partnership probably get a uh an, a partnership agreement and rob um has a template and he actually offered it to my listeners if he, you know if they want one um, he would help you get it so maybe i could help somebody get that but i would recommend that you go to your lawyer and draft up your partnership agreement and what does that look like so what happens worst case scenario somebody divorces does it go to does his share go to the kids or his wife or you know how does that work because you don't want to get in a situation where you had three partners and now you got five you know you don't want that or you don't want in a situation where a guy says i look i wanted to get in and get out of this really fast um, I was hoping to make money and you're like, well, dude, we're in here for 10 or 15 years because we've got to let this timber mature and then we're going to cut it along the way. Oh, I don't want it to cut. What do you mean? Talk logging? No. And so all these little nuances of an agreement, you kind of got to figure out on the front end. Um, 
I honestly, generally, I know some guys, there's some guys with whitetail properties that are partnered. I think there's like 15 of them in an investment group. But they figured this out on a really high level. It's like it's a business of buying, managing, and selling American land, as I say on my podcast. Um, and they approach it that way, not just a couple buddies. Let's just pull our money yeah. together and go buy something. So that's what I would say about partners. They're not for me, I don't think. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, and that's the way I look at it, too. Because, it, And I've even said that to a couple of them. As I'm like, you know, we got to look at this like a business. I mean, exactly. Absolutely. It, be, because, you know, it, what you said is, you know, I didn't go, you know, that crazy. Because it was more around a campfire. Like, hey, you know, we should go in and buy some property yeah. together. You know, and it's like, yeah. like Never that's make all, a decision when there's whiskey yeah, involved. Exactly. It's like, that's good. And, and I, I would have no problem with it. But, you know. I mean, everyone can probably relate to this. I mean, I've had, you know, people that I thought were good friends that just up and ghost you, you know, and, and all yeah. of a sudden you're out of their life. And it's like, well, what happens if we're on a $300,000 piece of property, you know, and, and that happens, you know, and now all of a sudden, you know, you've got some issues going on. It's just, I mean, it's one of those things to where exactly like you said, there's other factors to get involved, um, you know, it all sounds good until, you know, something goes bad, yeah. you know, type of thing. So, yeah, it's just I, I hear that a lot. I know you hear it a lot. Probably have dealt with it. Um, but, yeah, that's something I wanted to I wanted to touch base on because, you know, personally, I, I've been struggling with it because I would like to manage my property just how I want to manage it, you know. And, and I know, you know, most people are not going to get into it with a, a wildlife biologist. And, and if you do, awesome. But, you know, it's like again, having those, those shared objectives, you know, for me and, and them, it's like, I, I would rather just manage it my way, <laughs> just yeah. have my own property and be like, Hey, I want to do this. I want to do this. Like, that's fine. Like I'm the one doing the work anyway. So, you know, that type of thing. Well, partnerships are definitely a way to get into a piece of property because you can obviously buy more than you could alone, but yeah. it just brings a whole nother level of complexity to the process that may suck the enjoyment factor right out of yeah. it if it starts to get ugly. Yeah, and part of it is too is is like, you know, that that in itself is worth money. You know, to you know, in my opinion is to not have you know the headaches to be able to have the freedom. Yeah, if it costs more and it's going to cost more for you to do it on your own, but I think the enjoyment factor would be a lot higher there not having to, you know, especially you start dealing with putting like a cabin on the property and then all of a sudden you show up and and one of the other families is there or let a friend use it without telling you and you had made it you know what i'm saying like in my head that's where i go and i'm like if i drive three hours to go hunt and then i find out there's other people there i'm gonna lose my mind you know yeah. type of thing so that that's kind of where my head goes with it i mean yeah but having that partnership agreement and stuff like that i mean i you you would be you would be ill-advised to not do that in any venture that you do business-wise with a friend or family member or anything like that. And, and honestly, it's nothing personal. I mean, it's... Well, here's another yeah. way to look at that. Sometimes I get guys that get complete analysis paralysis and they can't make a decision. And it gets in the way of them making money if they're investing, if they're looking at this from an investment opportunity, because they start to overanalyze like everything that could go wrong. And you start to spend all your time and energy looking at all the negatives. Of course, you need to look at and evaluate some of that. But sometimes you just got to sit back and go, all right, I'm going to have to have a little latitude here on this. You know, um, I'm not buying a piece of property for myself. I'm buying this as an investment. Otherwise, why would I bring in partnerships? I'm this is a this is there's multiple people involved here. So I might go out there sometime and find that they're they're hunting or maybe I just need to organize that on the front end and say, hey, we're going to have a board and all the stands going to be labeled and you have to schedule your time there. And everybody has to be on board with that way before you get started. But um, sometimes, you know, I've had I've had people that are, again, buying. Land. I just had this recently. A guy was buying a piece of property as an investment. That's how they were terming it. And then they start asking me these questions that I could not answer. And they're like they wanted me to answer these questions. And I finally said, you know, I'm going to be upfront with you. I'm going to say something here that's going to rock you a little bit. Maybe this is an investment for you because 
You're looking for certainty in something that cannot be provided. I cannot predict the future. And it's driving you crazy because you want to have every contingency figured out before and be assured that none of this is ever going to be a problem. And I am not going to be able to tell you that that isn't going to be a problem because you're stepping into the world of speculating, speculation land and uh, buying and there's risk. So maybe this isn't for you. And the guy says, what? It sounds like you're trying to talk me out of it. I said, no, I, I I make my living by you buying property. I want you to buy it, but I'm also your agent and I'm advising you that I cannot answer that. And you feel very, I could tell you feel very uncomfortable. So maybe you shouldn't move forward. And he did. I felt like, okay, well, I advised you as best I could and you made your own decision. But some guys, you know, so it goes back to this partnership. Maybe that is not the route to go if you're a guy that's so anal about controlling every detail. Because as soon as you bring in other people, it is uncontrollable at some level, somewhere, sometime. Yeah, that's... Every time. It's the way it works, man. You hear people all the time. Don't go into business with friends or family, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, my my, my little group of buddies that, that hunt stuff like that, you know, in, in the back of my head, I know it's not going to be a problem. But, you know, at the same time, like I said, you know, it's something to where, you know, everybody kind of wants their own piece of land. But, yeah, you know, the realization, some people might not ever really be able to afford it on their own, but they get a couple buddies that want to go in. They do it the right way. And, Hey, I know people that have done that as well. I've, I've hunted people's property where, you know, they've got a bunch of different owners, you know, they went in together on it and it's been fine, you know, so not saying definitely it can't be done, but just keep your, just keep your eyes open, your, you know, mind open a little bit and think a little bit before, like you said, whiskey makes the decision for you. <laughs> that could be as a, that's never, never a be good thing. Be careful with that. Yeah, exactly. Especially around a campfire, you know, during hunting season and yeah, you get going. But anyway, all right, Neil, I want to, um, we can wrap this up. It's been a little over an hour here and, and that's a lot of good stuff, you know, because this is a subject where I think a lot of people really just like anything. I mean, you can get on YouTube and listen to a lot of different people talk about different subjects. And, you know, we always talk about, you know, deciphering what's good information and, and, and things like that. So, you know, when I had this, uh, idea, this log of episodes I wanted to do, I wanted to have kind of a, a real estate introductory, you know, kind of you know, thinking outside the box episode, if you will, you know, getting people answered those questions. And there's plenty of those episodes out there. I'm not reinventing the wheel here by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but why don't you go ahead and, uh, you know, plug how people can get a hold of you and, uh, you know, we'll kind of wrap it up from there. Okay. Uh, well, first off, I enjoy doing this and I hope I can bring value to people out there. Um, I, um, really, really enjoy the business aspect of of the business of land sales. Um, I'm also into the management, so I love to hunt and talk about it. So if anybody that is listening to this would like to just like dive deeper into something that we said, they can always give me a call. Probably the best way to find me is just go to whitetailproperties.com, click on the agents tab, type in Neil H in that box, hit enter and scroll down. You'll see my, my face. If they click on that, they can see my listings, they can see my bio and my contact information is there. So that's the easiest way. Um, my phone number is 612-619-7062. Just call me, text me, either way. And then if they do want to follow me on my social media, um, I have a YouTube channel called The American Landman. Um, just go to YouTube and type in Neil Hogger Land Specialist, you'll find it. And I have a um, podcast myself called the American land man buying, managing and selling American land. And I'm on all the top, you know, sites like Spotify and Apple, Google. So please come there and, and follow me and listen to more. This is what we talk about. And, um, like I said, if anybody ever wants to talk, I I'm glad to help. Anytime. Awesome, man. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. So, uh, everybody, thanks for, uh, checking out this episode and until next time, we'll see you. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Hunt Science Podcast. I want to thoroughly take this time to thank everybody who has listened or even watched till the end of this episode and, and had the opportunity to uh, hopefully enjoy the show that we put out for you. It's something that we're really trying to do and take notes and uh, you know put good quality content for everybody to enjoy. 
We want to take this moment also to, if you enjoyed the show, check us out over on our social media platforms. Give us a like, give us a follow, check that bell notification, look for the content that we're putting out. Of course, reach out to us, leave comments. Did you like the show? We would love to hear uh, your reviews of the show and any concerns that you have, any any uh, updates or any type of uh, uh, feedback to make our, our content better. We're always uh, open ears for the people that are consuming our show and our content. We want to hear from you. What is it that you want to see and what is it that you would like us to do? If you want to check us out on any of our social media, first off, you can head over to our website, go to www.huntsciencepodcast.com. You can check us out on Instagram at huntscience underscore podcast, or you can check us out over at our Facebook page at The Hunt Science Podcast. Any of those is, is open. You can, like I said, feel free to comment and, and all of the above that you do with social media. I just want to take this time again to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everybody for watching and listening to the content that we're putting out. It means the world to me, and I can't wait for you guys to join us on another episode. Until then, everybody, have a great day, and we'll see you next time.